So carpal tunnel syndrome is a condition we get asked about all the time. And so today we're gonna to run through the key things that you need to know. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So in this video, I'm going to be taking you through the key causes of carpal tunnel syndrome, key points for assessment and diagnosis, and of course, how we treat it in practice. But first of all, what is carpal tunnel syndrome? So the carpal tunnel is located in the palmar or anterior side of the wrist joint. This is where the median nerve runs through before it gives sensation and muscle power to the hand. Now we have a specific soft tissue structure, the flexor retinaculum, which runs over the top of the carpal tunnel in order to protect it. However, sometimes that flexor retinaculum can actually compress the structures of the carpal tunnel, including the median nerve, which gives us these nerve-based symptoms in our hand, which is what we call carpal tunnel syndrome. Those nerve symptoms are characterized by pain, but most commonly numbness and pins and needles in the first, second, third and lateral half or radial half of the fourth digit because as you can see here those are the fingers that the median nerve runs into. Now in some severe cases of carpal tunnel syndrome we can also get weakness of this opposition movement of the thumb because again this is a movement supplied by the median nerve. So causes. We're thinking of activities that include heavy usage or repeated usage of the hands, things like repetitive gripping or in particular repeated wrist flexion because that's going to put pressure on that anterior part of the wrist where the carpal tunnel is and of course that median nerve. Examples are going to include gardening, working with vibrating power tools or working in an assembly or factory role that involves packaging items. One really interesting point is using a keyboard or mouse for long hours as Kozak et al. 2015 actually established that there was very little association between computer use and carpal tunnel syndrome. We know it's more common in women than men by three to one. We know it can be more prevalent in those who are obese because of adipose tissue causing that compression element that we talked about, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetics, and one that you'll see all the time is pregnancy related carpal tunnel syndrome. And that's due to fluid retention as a result of hormone changes during pregnancy. That fluid retention can lead to subsequent increased swelling of those soft tissue structures, which can cause that compression of that median nerve in the carpal tunnel. So on to assessment and diagnosis. Well, from the subjective history, the key things we're listening for from our patients are those symptoms of pins and needles and numbness in the first, second, third and the lateral half of the fourth digit because those are the areas that the median nerve supplies with sensory input. But also thinking about the causes, we're thinking about those aggravating factors, that repetitive gripping, repetitive wrist flexion, listening out for the past medical history of diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, looking for obesity, and of course, thinking about patients who are newly pregnant. So on to our objective testing. We might start by thinking about observation and palpation of the thena eminence of the hand, compare it to the other side, see if there's a particular wasting there, as this area is supplied by the median nerve. We can also also think about that thumb opposition so we can look at active movement or resisted strength because again opponent's pollicis is supplied by the median nerve but remember those movements and the thena eminence is only going to be really affected in the most severe cases of carpal tunnel syndrome. But the most relevant part of our objective assessment for carpal tunnel syndrome is going to be a series of key special tests which aim to reproduce those key symptoms we spoke about, pins and needles and numbness in that relative distribution for the median nerve. These are really nicely highlighted by Curry, Tedesina, and McKinnon in their 2022 paper, starting with Durkin's test or the Durkin's maneuver, which quite simply involves relatively firm palpation over the carpal tunnel region. And a positive result here would be that reproduction of the patient's specific pins and needles and numbness in that distribution that we spoke about earlier. This has good sensitivity and specificity with a sensitivity of 64% and a specificity of 83%. Then we have Phelan's test. This was described by Osiak et al. 2021 as having quite varied sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity between 10 and 88% and specificity between 47 and 100%. So in order to do this test, we basically ask our patient to place the back of their hands against each other, which is going to bring up that wrist flexion position, which is gonna compress into the carpal tunnel. 
we're going to ask them to keep their elbows where they are but then lift their hands to further compress the area and they're going to hold it for around 30 to 60 seconds. Here, a positive result would once again be that reproduction of that pins and needles and numbness and would indicate carpal tunnel syndrome. Then we have Tinell's test for the carpal tunnel. This was described by McDermott and Vessel as having sensitivity of 50% and specificity of 77% and basically involves repeated, relatively firm tapping of the median nerve region within the carpal tunnel and we're aiming to do this again for around 30 to 60 seconds to see if we reproduce those pins and needles and numbness symptoms. A positive reproduction would indicate a positive test and would highlight the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. Now the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome can be further confirmed by nerve conduction studies. These are a series of tests in which we measure the speed and the strength of impulses going through a particular nerve, for example the median nerve, to see if that nerve is functioning properly. Now Oziak et al 2021 highlighted that nerve conduction studies can be really really valid for diagnosing carpal tunnel syndrome with sensitivity of over 80% and specificity of 95%. So quite high and a good way of confirming your diagnosis. So on to treatment of carpal tunnel in practice. So starting with activity modification, is there any way that we might be able to change the way our patient is doing things currently to reduce that wrist flexion or compressive load onto the carpal tunnel? So for example, if they're a keen gardener, could we reduce the intensity of their gardening? Can they space out their gardening at different times during the week rather than concentrate it all in one go? If they're working in that factory role, using their hands, doing lots of packing, is there any way we can move them to a different part of the factory temporarily where they're doing a slightly different role? Any way that we can reduce that compression on that median nerve. Next, another really simple step we can use is splinting. Burke, Ellis, McKenna and Bradley highlighted that when the wrist is in a neutral position, it puts the lowest amount of pressure through the carpal tunnel and that pressure can significantly increase as soon as we go into high levels of wrist flexion and extension. And therefore, wrist splints, just like you can see here, can be used by patients in order to try and maintain that neutral position. This can be used during the activities that your patient is doing that might irritate that carpal tunnel syndrome, but also specifically at night. We realize that patients do suffer a lot with their symptoms at night, and therefore patients can use that splint throughout their sleep during the night to hopefully give them a better night's sleep. So on to exercises. There is a particular exercise that I do give some of the patients I have with carpal tunnel syndrome, and those are some nerve glider exercises. But I have to start by saying, I do tend to reserve these for those who are less irritable. If they have more irritable symptoms, I tend to find that the nerve gliders seem to just stir them up a bit further. So nerve gliders are a series of exercises where rather than stretching the nerve, we're simply allowing it to slide and glide at the same length through its normal pathway. So for example, I have one that I often give which uses the neck, as you can see up here, where we're extending the wrist and extending the elbow at the same time as laterally flexing the neck towards the moving arm. And a second slider exercise is that which just focuses on the elbow. Here I'm extending the wrist as I flex the elbow and then flexing the wrist as I extend the elbow, as you can see up here. With both of these exercises, I tend to give them for about 30 seconds, two to three times a day, but the key instruction to the patient is making sure that these exercises are not over irritating or stirring up their symptoms. So therefore, as a result, if you find that the exercise is stirring it up for your patient, maybe try and suggest that they move the arm a bit less, extend the wrist a bit less than they have been doing, trying to see if they can do it without aggravating their symptoms. So the other common management option is a steroid injection. This can be provided by a local GP or a local specialist practitioner to basically try and settle down some of those soft tissue structures and provide a great big dose of pain relief to the area. So you might see in practice that the common pathway is that most patients are offered the steroid injection with the splinting and generally that tends to do the job for most people. However, if it doesn't improve their symptoms, patients can be referred on for surgery in the form of a carpal tunnel release. This is where a surgeon will cut a specific piece of soft tissue called the transverse carpal ligament in order to decompress that median nerve. 
And actually, this is shown to have relative effectiveness. Louis, Earp and Blazar in 2012 highlighted that existing long-term studies showed a success rate of 75 to 90% for carpal tunnel release surgery. So that's certainly promising for our patients. So guys, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please support us by smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel for all our best updates. And you can find even more from us on Instagram at Clinical Physio or at our website, clinicalphysio.com. I'm Khalid, thank you so much for watching. See you really soon here on Clinical Physio.